Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. 1,200 Palestinians held in Israeli jails declare an open-ended hunger strike. Amnesty International criticizes Bahrain over ongoing human rights crisis. And Ahmadinejad warns the West against attacking Iran. Mosaic, world news from the Middle East begins now. In occupied Palestine, events were held to mark Prisoners' Day. 1,200 Palestinian detainees in Israeli prisons began an open-ended hunger strike in protest of their mistreatment and ongoing detention. Participants in the event demanded the release of the prisoners. During the Prisoners' Day rally, Speaker of the Palestinian Legislative Council, Ahmed Bahar, called for escalating the armed resistance to liberate the prisoners. For his part, former Minister of Prisoners Affairs Hisham Abdul Razak highly praised the detainees' hunger strike and denounced the international community's silence on the occupation's practices. He called for showing solidarity with the prisoners in order to end their suffering. From across the Gaza Strip, tens of thousands of Palestinians flowed into the streets to take part in the events marking Palestinian Prisoners' Day. Thousands of Palestinian and Arab prisoners are still subjected to the most horrific practices by the Israeli prison administration. Participants called on the factions of the resistance to kidnap Israeli soldiers to force the Israeli occupation to release all the prisoners. Today we are here in Gaza and the squares of Gaza. All of us came out. We tell the Palestinian prisoners, we are with you until you triumph over the will of the Zionist wardens. Specifically, I say the only policy of dealing with the occupation is resistance and kidnapping the soldiers so they can be traded for prisoners from the occupation's jails. Over 800,000 Palestinians have spent various periods of time in Israeli prisons. Tens of thousands of Palestinians came out today in solidarity with the thousands of remaining prisoners. Participants condemned Israel's violations of the prisoners' rights and its repressive practices against them. We send all our greetings to the Arab and Islamic nations, and we want massive demonstrations to affirm their real solidarity with the heroic prisoners. Leaders from every faction and civil society organization called for unifying the Palestinian front to achieve the goal of liberating the prisoners and attaining the remaining legitimate national rights of the Palestinian people. They vow to continue all forms of struggle until they fully attain their rights. All Palestinian people are behind you. We, along with you, are engaging in one battle and facing the Zionist enemy and confronting the world's arrogant policy. So, God willing, we will be with you and behind you and support you with all our means, God willing, and that includes kidnapping Zionist soldiers in order to trade them for your freedom, God willing. All Palestinian communities renewed their commitment to all forms of struggle and resistance until the prisoners are freed from Israeli jails. They demanded the international community and human rights organizations put an end to the Israeli violations and prosecute those who committed war crimes. Mustafa Abu al-Hadi, Al-Alam, Gaza, Palestine. وفي الضفة الغربية توجه الفلسطينيون إلى سجن عوفر للاعتصام استنكارا للممارسات الإسرائيلية بحق الأسر. In the West Bank, Palestinians headed to Ofer prison for a sit-in to condemn the Israeli practices against the Palestinian prisoners. The Palestinians clashed with the occupation soldiers who dispersed the protesters by force and kicked them out of areas near the detention house. A variety of events were held to mark the Palestinian Prisoners' Day in the city of Ramallah. Participants called for unity and an end to the division and denounced the policy of administrative detention adopted by the occupation authorities. In addition, they called on political parties, all Palestinian factions, associations and labor unions to support the resistance until victory is attained. senior IDF officer has been suspended after being caught on camera using his rifle to assault a foreign activist. As the news broke, officials condemned the behavior and the IDF has launched a probe into the incident. IBA's Dennis Zinn has more. 
IDF Advocate General Daniel Froni today ordered the military police to investigate the actions of the deputy commander of the Jordan Valley Brigade, Lieutenant Colonel Shalom Eisner, who hit an unarmed Danish protester in the face with his M16 rifle on Saturday. It was this footage shot by a local Palestinian cameraman and broadcast all over the world that caused the outcry. 20-year-old Danish pro-Palestinian activist Andreas Ayas required stitches to his lower lip. The head of the IDF Central Command, Nitzan Alon, suspended Eisner from duty pending the outcome of the military police investigation. Chief of Staff Benny Gantz called the incident serious. President Shimon Peres said he was shocked by the pictures. And Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said such behavior does not characterize IDF officers or soldiers. Uh, let's be clear here. This sort of behavior is in stark contrast to our norms and our values and is simply unacceptable. Soldiers and officers are not ordered to behave this way and uh, of course it's, we see it in a very uh, severe manner. Uh, the chief of staff ordered to initiate an investigation regarding this matter. Several rabbis and settler activists spoke up in defense of Eisner. They said that he's a good officer and a moral person who generally shies away from violence. They said that the clip shown on TV was heavily edited and does not show what led up to the incident. Eisner, for his part, accused the Dane of attacking him with a club and breaking two of his fingers. In this edited footage, we see Eisner with a bandaged hand. And earlier on in the material, when he confronted the protester, his hand is exposed. But at the end of the day, Eisner is going to have a hard time defending his action. It seems not only a brutal act, but also foolish. IDF troops operating the territories are constantly warned not to take the law into their own hands. They are also repeatedly reminded that there are cameras documenting their every move. This incident is also likely to trigger the ongoing public debate over whether it is the army troops that should deal with unarmed protesters in the West Bank, especially if the protesters are foreign nationals. Dennis Zinn, IBA News. As for the foreign pro-Palestinian flightilla campaign, after much media hype, most protesters were never allowed to leave Europe, and those arriving in Israel were detained and deported. In the end, only a handful of activists actually reached Bethlehem as planned. IBA's Eli Wagelanter has more on the story. 79 pro-Palestinian activists were denied entry into Israel yesterday, with 31 of the protesters taken to detention in Ramla. Almost all have been flown back to their home countries, and police have taken Ben-Gurion Airport off of high alert. Flightilla organizers said hundreds of people had tried to come and failed. We have many people who were arrested at the airport who managed to arrive to Ben-Gurion Airport, to Alit Airport. We have about 400 French and 100 Belgian and many others from other countries who were forbidden to take the plane from origin. And those who managed to get in were also arrested at the airport. Most of the foreign activists detained were French citizens, while the rest came from Italy, Spain, Portugal, Canada, and Switzerland. The European Union's high representative for foreign affairs, Catherine Ashton, called on Bahrain today to save the life of jailed activist on hunger strike, Abdul Hadi Al Khawaja. She said his health is now a matter of the utmost urgency. Amnesty International said human rights violations are continuing in Bahrain, even though the Bahraini government accepted the International Fact-Finding Committee's recommendations. According to a new report released by the organization, al Manama failed to achieve justice for the protesters. It described the reforms in Bahrain as flawed and unable to provide justice for the victims of the violations. More than a year has passed since protests erupted in Bahrain. The past year witnessed casualties within the ranks of those who came out to condemn the government's policies. Demonstrators gradually raised the ceiling of their demands, eventually calling for the downfall of the regime. al Manama responded to international criticism by forming a fact-finding committee that recommended at the end of its mission the political reform of the regime and its judiciary and security systems. 
But Bahraini opposition forces believe the government did not commit to the committee's suggestions. Instead, they believe the government outmaneuvered the recommendations and implemented only parts of them. Amnesty International adopted this position in its latest report on the Bahraini crisis. The report said government reforms are flawed and have failed to provide justice for the victims of human rights violations in Bahrain. It continues to hold large numbers of people in detention. It has imposed very harsh sentences on people without fair trials. There are 14 opposition leaders that remain in custody. There has been no high-level accountability for those abuses. So we see window dressing in the form of independent investigation that gave an aura of seriousness on the part of the government in terms of living up to their human rights responsibilities, but very little in the way of follow through. Very little in the way of follow through. In its report, the organization criticized what it viewed as the Bahraini government's attempts to convince the international community that the country is taking the path of reform, while its security institutions continue to practice torture and use excessive force against the protesters. So they've, you know, done the typical. So they've, you know, done the typical thing in a sense by going after those low-level people who are on the front lines, but were really just following orders. So we've been really dissatisfied in terms of any seriousness about holding accountable those who are making the decisions issuing the orders, and we're really masterminding this crackdown. At the end of its report, Amnesty International called on the Bahraini government to turn its words into actions, release all prisoners of conscience, and hold the perpetrators of torture and those who killed protesters accountable. استنكر وزراء خارجية دول مجلس التعاون الخليجي استنكر زيارة الأخيرة للرئيس Gulf Cooperation Council Foreign Ministers denounced the last visit of Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad to Abu Musa Island. They described it as a provocative act that contradicts good neighborly policies. At the end of their exceptional meeting in Doha, the Cooperation Council's foreign ministers demanded their Iranian counterparts end the occupation of the islands that belong to the Emirates and comply with Abu Dhabi's call to find a fair and peaceful solution through bilateral negotiations or referral to the International Court of Justice. The ministers announced their solidarity with the Emirates and their support of all the measures the country is taking to retrieve its rights and sovereignty over its islands. In Iran, President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad said the security of the Gulf is based on mutual security between all the states of the area. In a military show celebrating Iran's Army Day, Ahmadinejad called on Gulf countries to work together to ensure the stability of the region. Militarily, there's nothing new on Iran's Army Day. Same weapons crossing the same road. However, the speech is different this time, and a calm tone distinguishes the statements of Iranian officials. Iran seems unaffected by an escalation with the West, following the latest talks in Istanbul, which were described as positive. President Ahmadinejad preferred directing his speech to those who criticized his last visit to the Abu Musa island in the Gulf. The president's words carried an invitation to his Arab neighbors. Security in the Persian Gulf is based on mutual security that needs the contribution of the region's states and people. The presence of foreign troops there undermines security. Iran is ready to secure the stability of this region in cooperation with the rest of the countries. This Iranian invitation is not new, but important in a phase during which the area of disagreement between Tehran and its southern neighbors is widening. Iran seems as if it does not sense any danger these days. The agreement with the West on nuclear affairs and other issues may have calmed its tone. Tehran says the main danger has been lessened, though slightly. What remains is what is described here as a push-and-pull strategy with neighboring Arab countries, even if it appears as an escalation. Since the beginning, Tehran firmly dealt with the Abu Musa issue. Abu Musa, according to Iran, is absolutely part of the Iranian territory. With that, Iran prefers to engage in a dialogue with the Gulf countries, including the Emirates.
The case of these islands is old. Focusing on it is not in the interest of these countries. I think that adopting a policy of confrontation is a wrong and unhelpful decision because of the region's distinct circumstances. Iranians rule out the outbreak of an escalated crisis with neighboring Gulf countries. However, they are warning some in the region, and even some outside of it, from fishing in murky waters. Abdelkader Fayez, Al Jazeera, Tehran. In Syria, dozens of people were killed by the gunfire of al-Assad's brigades. Most of the victims were killed in Idlib province, where its town of Ariha is enduring heavy and indiscriminate shelling, similar to the shelling of Homs neighborhoods and other towns in the Dara province. Meanwhile, the head of the international observers team said their mission is not easy and requires the coordination of all Syrian sides. Five days have passed since the cooling off period was announced. Meanwhile, the Syrian regime continues to violate the ceasefire, ignoring its commitment to the joint UN Arab envoy to Syria, Kofi Annan. Even with the presence of international observers on the ground, al Assad's brigades launched a new round of heavy shelling targeting homes neighborhoods, especially Al Baida and Al Haladiyah, where mortar shells fell on residential homes. The situation was not much different in Homs Jawabar and Al Sultania neighborhoods, which are witnessing heavy and indiscriminate shelling amid a dire humanitarian crisis caused by the absence of food and medical supplies. This has led to additional problems, especially for the injured and the sick. A number of ceasefire violations were also reported in Idlib, where dozens of residents were killed and dozens of others were wounded. This comes as Syrian security forces continue to carry out fierce military operations across various villages in the eastern region of Jabal al Zawiyah. The army deployed dozens of armored vehicles and tanks amid heavy mortar and artillery shelling. The operation was concentrated in the towns of Ariha, Saja, Bathabar and Kafar Lata. The latter was stormed by al Assad's brigades deploying helicopters and opening heavy fire. The Syrian Revolution's General Commission said that several people were executed by the Shabiha in the city of Idlib. In Daraa, several residents were killed or injured due to the regime forces' artillery and rocket shelling that targeted Basar al Harir in their attempt to take control of that village. In addition, the area of Lija in Daraa witnessed heavy gunfire and artillery shelling amid sounds of powerful explosions. Lija, which is a steep rocky area is home to a large number of defectors from the regime's army. In Hama, snipers were heavily deployed on school rooftops in the area of Khalet al Madikh. Armored vehicles were also entrenched in Al Qasur neighborhood amid heavy gunfire. Meanwhile, al Assad's brigade stormed the town of Lahaya in the countryside of Hama and carried out indiscriminate home raids and arrests. In the countryside of Damascus, particularly in Thakba, the army continued to display a military presence and has set up barriers on the city's streets as helicopters flew overhead in a blatant violation of the truce. Amid the fragile ceasefire, the international observers continued their mission in Syria by touring areas outside the capital, Damascus. On their first day, the observers held intensive talks for hours at the Syrian foreign ministry headquarters. The head of the International Observers Team in Syria, Colonel Ahmed Hamish, said their mission is not easy. Egypt's electoral body has rejected appeals filed by candidates disqualified from running for the May presidential election. The electoral body has disqualified 10 of the 23 registered candidates. Three main disqualified candidates are Egypt's former intelligence chief Omar Suleiman, Khairat al shatir from the Muslim Brotherhood and the ultra-conservative Salafist Hazem Abu Ismail. The Electoral Commission argues its decision is based on legal grounds. A final list of candidates will be released just under a month before the April 26th vote. Among the barred candidates, Omar Suleiman is notorious for his role in the brutal suppression of any opposition to the former regime. Women and children have taken to the streets in Pakistan's southwestern city of Quetta to condemn the recent wave of targeted killings of Shia Muslims. Protesters shouted slogans against the government and law enforcement agencies for their failure to curb the killings in the provincial capital, Baluchistan. A strike was also held on Sunday against the sectarian violence. Dozens of Shia Muslims from the Hazara community have been killed over the past few days. 
Balochistan's chief minister has warned of civil war in the province if the targeted killings continue. Activists have urged the government to arrest those involved in the massacres. The country's Shia leaders have also called on the government to form a judicial commission to investigate the crimes. The military coup in Mali has divided the West African country between the central and northern parts, the latter being a stronghold of local fighters. A correspondent, Daniel Arapmoy, has been following the story from the capital, Bamako. He says that there's a mixed reaction as citizens wait for the interim government to resolve the instability in the West African nation. The recent military coup in Mali continues to generate debate across the political divide, with citizens looking up to the interim government trying to beat a deadline of 40 days set for a fresh election. Mali's capital Bamako is currently awash with political debate in anticipation of an election many consider may not bring about the much-desired peace and stability in this once united West African country. Residents here say they want to see a country free from political upheavals and favorable for the welfare of all citizens and visitors. Which type of Mali that I want to see is a Mali without corruption, a Mali without nepotism, a Mali where everybody feels that I'm concerned with the building of the country. According to some residents, the interim government should first focus on addressing the threats posed by the northern local fighters as opposed to organizing an election whose outcome many consider may not bring about the much needed political change. First priority now is to, to fight against uh, these rebels who took our north. We have to think about it first not to think about the place, I want to be the governor or the president, or I want to be the, the prime minister, is not a time for that. Last month, Captain Amadou Haya Sanogo led a coup that toppled the government of President Amadou Tomani Tore after accusing the latter of poor administration that has kept the country in long-standing instability. After pressure from regional bloc ECOWAS and international criticism, Captain Sanogo accepted to step aside for former Speaker of Parliament, John Kunda Trahore, who was sworn in as the interim president on the 12th of this month. In northern Mali, local fighters have seized off a huge part of the country, demanding for autonomy from the rest of the south. With or without the coup, and whether the interim government will organize an election after the 40 days, the ordinary people here continue to demand for a lasting solution that will eventually bring about peace and stability to a united Mali. The Sudanese parliament declared it voted to brand the government of South Sudan an enemy of Khartoum. This comes after South Sudanese forces occupied the oil-producing Sudanese area of Heglij. The announcement declaring South Sudan's government an enemy of Sudan added that Sudanese state institutions must deal with the South accordingly. The head of the parliament called for ousting the government of South Sudan. The following report explores the mysteries of the Sudanese crisis. It is a coincidence that the land of the Sudanese unity state is a post-secession battlefield between the north and the south. The disputed state is located in the south and holds the Bentiu area that has one of the most important oil fields in Sudan, the Heglige field. And while oil continues to be a contentious issue between Sudan and the emerging South Sudanese state, Juba does not hesitate to provoke Khartoum and drag it into an armed conflict. Juba is backed by Israel, and according to the Israel Today newspaper, the country is training and arming the South Sudanese army. The newspaper revealed that Israeli warplanes land daily in the Robkona airport in South Sudan and confirm that planes unload missiles and arms, in addition to transporting African mercenaries, ready to fight on the side of the South Sudanese army against Sudan. 
بل تعود إلى مطلع ستينات القرن الماضي منذ انطلقت حركة التمرد المسلح. The relationship between Israel and South Sudan is not new, but goes back to the early 1960s when the armed rebellion was first launched and was known as the Anyaniya and led by Captain Joseph Lagu in Uganda. The support was not limited to weapons, but military camps led by Israeli officers were established in Uganda. In the 1980s, the second armed rebellion started with the Sudan People's Liberation Movement led by John Garang. During in this stage, Israel's arming and training of the movement grew. Following the secession of South Sudan, there was no longer a reason for secrecy and covertness, and the newly established state's president, Salva Kiir, visited Israel after the two states started their official relationship on the basis of strategic cooperation. Kiir's famous statement was, had it not been for you, we would not have been able to exist. You fought with us for the establishment of South Sudan. Israel's battle for the establishment of South Sudan was not fought with the southerners in mind, but it it was part of an Israeli effort to create a non-Muslim sub-Saharan African coalition led by Israel, with South Sudan at its forefront. The Israeli aspiration is not limited to the continent's oil, gold and uranium resources, but extends to water as Israel seeks to control the water springs that feed the Nile River. For this reason, it financed South Sudan's Nile water dam projects. And this will cause a conflict that neither Sudan nor Egypt are likely to idly stand by and watch. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Winco Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.